Praise the Lord. It is good to be back in the house of God this evening with Free Indeed Ministry. I'm James Cooper. And we're preaching that truth that Jesus said, if you know this truth, it will make you free. And it's simply the truth about Christ. It's the truth of who Christ is, what God sent Him to do, and how that He did it. And then putting our trust in Him and that finished work of Calvary. And that truth will make the believer free. It's a message that has been lost for a very long time. And it also brings a reality that has been lost for a very long time. You know, so many people are trusting in something that gives them no proof whatsoever that, that they're saved or that, they're, that they possess what they believe they possess. It has no proof whatsoever. And they will not know until it's too late. So many in the world today believe that Jesus took their penalty for sin on the cross. And that when they stand before God on Judgment Day, as long as they believe in Jesus, that they cannot miss heaven, that they, they will be allowed to enter in because they believe in Jesus, even though they still have that sin nature in their heart because they believe He took the penalty, He took the punishment for their sin. There is no proof in the Scriptures of such a doctrine that has filled the churches today. There is no proof in the one that trusts in that or believes in it because they still have their sin. There's not a radical transformation in them. They're the same sinful creature. They can become very religious and they can even do better and, 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 and maybe not be the same person they used to be, but if sin is still in the heart, it's still a sinful creature and it will in no wise enter the kingdom of God. So many people believe that they're forgiven. Every time they sin, they just ask God to forgive them. And doing the prison ministry, man, I have heard so many different doctrines and, and gospels, so many different Jesuses preached, just like the apostles warned us about. And one of them is that... that Jesus died to forgive you. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. If He died to forgive you for your sin, He died in vain. God was already forgiving sin. But I want to show you something. We're going to go to Exodus 34. And I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. In Exodus 34 and 6, this is when God came down and introduced Himself to Moses. And it says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Now it says, God was forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. But it says this, that would by no means clear the guilty. And that word clear, I looked it up again just before I came over to the church. And the definition in the Hebrew said to, to be or make clean, to acquit to be blameless, to be free, be or hold as guiltless or be innocent. God said, I will forgive iniquity, transgression, and sins, but this will by no means clear the guilty. They will not be innocent. They will not be free. They will not be clean. It will not acquit them. They will still stand guilty before God. Forgiveness is not salvation. Forgiveness... And, and, and I thank God for forgiveness. Praise God. There is forgiveness at the cross of Christ, but the cross goes so much farther than that. The cross is the answer for sin. It is deliverance. It is the death of the old man, crucified with Christ. God 
gave the perfect answer and remedy for sin. And it's not you got to try harder, you got to do better. It's death, death in union with Christ, crucified with Christ. When the old man of sin is dead, there is no more sin nature in that person. That is what salvation is, saved from sin, rescued from sin. But under the old covenant, God forgave sins. For 4,000 years before Jesus was ever born, God forgave sins. Now I want to go over to a prophecy of the Christ that we go to so often. This is the most important prophecy in the entire Bible. Because if you will read and believe the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, it tells exactly what the mission of Christ is. I said that truth that will make you free is the truth about Christ, who He is, and what God sent Him to do. Christ is the creator of all things. That, was, that word that was made flesh, the word that was in the beginning with God, that was God, all things were made by Him. That's who Christ is. And that word was made flesh and dwelt among us in the body of Jesus Jesus, the Christ of God, the Christ of prophecy. But here, this prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 is telling us what His mission is. It's telling us exactly what God sent Christ into the world to do. And notice, in Exodus, God said He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sins. But that doesn't for clear the guilty. Forgiveness doesn't clear the guilty. Now here, Christ came to finish the transgression and make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Everything that God was forgiving under that old covenant, Christ came to destroy, to take it away, to take it out of the heart and take it out of the nature and to reconcile us back to God to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now, so many words have lost their meaning in the church today. When you hear people say, man, I'm saved, but I'm still a sinner, I have to ask them, what are you saved from? There is no way to be saved by the salvation of God through Christ and still be a sinner because He came to save His people from their sin to rescue them from their sin, to make an end of sin. That means there's no more. Praise God. Nobody can be saved from sin and still be a sinner. Those who believe they're saved and still living in sin, they believe they're saved from hell. But that's not the gospel of Christ. That's not even in the Word of God. Nobody is saved from hell while they continue in their sin. The wages of sin is death. Always has been since the entrance of sin and always will be. Praise God. But the old covenant, God forgave iniquity, transgression, and sin, but they were still guilty. They were still a sinner. They still had the sin nature, the nature of the serpent in them. But what Christ came to do was to finish that transgression and make an end of sin. That's why I say the cross goes so much farther than forgiveness. But that word reconcile, I want to talk about this evening. And just like the word saved has lost its meaning in the church, reconciled. What does reconciled mean? And what were we needing to be reconciled from? Because God made man in His likeness and His image. Crowned Him with glory and honor. What God made in mankind is what God is. And what God is is what He made man to be. Holy, righteous. One of the things Christ came to do, make an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Bring back in the very nature of God. To make an end of sin is taking away that nature of the serpent and bringing back in the nature of God. This is reconciling mankind back to God. 
to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now reconciled. We all know what the word means until we start talking about being reconciled to God. But being reconciled, you know if a, if a husband and wife are separated and you hear they've, they've reconciled, you know they've came back together. Well, sin is what separated man from God. Man was made in the likeness and image of God, holy, with perfect fellowship with God. There was nothing between mankind and God. Perfect harmony. Sin, the entrance of sin separated man from God. Man lost that likeness and image of God. But to be reconciled, it's to be reconciled from iniquity. Back to God. Iniquity, that inner working of sin in the heart is what separated us from God. But to be reconciled means that thing has to be done away with. That iniquity, that, that sin has to be taken away, has to be done away with. And Christ would do that at the cross and bring in everlasting righteousness. Praise God. I'm going to go to... Uh, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but I'm going to share a, a testimony, a story. In the prison ministry, I was in one of the services one day, and I wasn't preaching this service. I was sitting in there listening. There was another minister preaching, and him and I did not agree on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was his service. He was scheduled to preach and he was up there preaching. And it was Brother Oscar and Brother Juan and I that were in there listening. And he was well into his message and he said, Jesus Christ died to forgive you for your sins. And when you sin, just ask him to forgive you. And, and, he, and he has to forgive you. That's what he died for. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you're going to tell them. And it scared me. Because this man is, it, he, for one thing, he does not approve of what I believe and what I preach. And that's his service. I cannot go up there and interrupt him and say, hey, 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 the Lord said for me to tell them something. I can't do that. And I knew the Lord had said, you're going to tell them. And I felt the presence of God come upon me. And, and the presence of God, I know, affects different people, different ways. But when I feel the presence of God, my body starts trembling. And the stronger His presence comes upon me, the, the more I tremble. And man, I felt the presence of God come and, and I started trembling, sitting there in that chair. And I looked at the clock. And it was 3.15, and that service is over at 4 o'clock. And in the prisons, in most of the prisons, man, when, that, when the, the time that is set for that service to be over, it's over right then. Because the officers come and get the men and take them back to their cells. They've got to go at that certain time. And it was 3.15 when the Lord spoke this to me, and I looked at the clock, and I just thought within myself, I, I spoke to the Lord within myself, I said, Lord, if this is your will, you will bring it to pass. And I sat there and I watched the clock. And this man is preaching and I know he's not going to ask me to come up and share something. He does not want me up there. He doesn't be believe what I preach and he don't want me preaching contrary to what he's preaching in his service. And 3.30 came. And the presence of God is just increasing. And man, there has been several times that I have felt the presence of God so strong. Not only my body is trembling, but I feel my insides start trembling. It feels like my guts are, are, are trembling inside of me. And, and that's how I was feeling. And 3.45 came. 
And I felt like I'm about to bounce out of that chair. I couldn't hardly sit still in that chair. And at 10 till 4, this man that was preaching, he stopped dead in his tracks and he looked at me. And he said, Brother Cooper, do you have something you want to share? And he walked over and handed me the microphone. I took the microphone and I I just got up and I said, if Jesus Christ died to forgive you for your sins, he died in vain. God was already forgiving sins for 4,000 years before Jesus was ever born. And I used this scripture in Exodus 34. I said, God introduced himself to Moses and said, I am the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sins for thousands, but this will by no means clear the guilty. Forgiveness is not salvation. It does not clear the guilty. They still stand guilty before God as a sinner. They're forgiven for what they did. But God destroyed the whole world except for eight souls in the days of Noah, not because of what they were doing, but because of what they are. He said the imaginations and thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. It was what they were that God destroyed mankind. And God said forgiveness does not clear them. They're still guilty. But He sent His Son to make an end of sin. Not to just forgive, but to take it out of the heart. To destroy the sin nature. And that man, that minister, grabbed his Bible and he walked out of the the church room mad. But why did God say you're going to tell them? That is an offense to God. That is an offense to Christ Jesus our Lord. To say He died to forgive you for your sins. No. No, He died to make you free from sin. He died to save you from your sin. Praise God. And that word saved means rescued, delivered. He died to rescue you from that which separated us from God, from the iniquity, from the sin, from the nature of the serpent that entered through Adam's transgression. He died to save His people from their sin. Praise God. That is the truth that Jesus said would make you free. He did it all at the cross. He did it all through His death, burial, and resurrection. And it's us knowing the truth, knowing that our old man of sin died with Him. Praise God. Everything is in union with Christ, our Creator. Only the Creator could die and that original creation would die with Him. My original creation, that sin nature that I was born with, died with Him on the cross. If I believe this and, and, and trust in Him, trust in what He did, trust in what the Word of God says, the sin just vanishes. It's gone. We're saved by grace, but, but not of our works. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. The Creator died. That original creation died with Him. And when God raised Him from the dead the third day, we came out of that tomb with Him. A new creature quickened with Christ. Created in Christ a new creature. Praise God. It is an offense to God to preach or tell others Jesus died to forgive you for your sin. Because that's what God has become to most people today or or so many people today. They believe He's the one you go to when you mess up and just ask Him to forgive you. That does not clear the guilty. That does not fix the problem. That does not create a new creature. As a matter of fact, those who repent over and over and over for the same sins, it makes them feel better. It comforts them and they feel like they've got a clean slate. They feel like, man, I'm okay now with the Lord until I do it again. The only reason somebody would do it again is because that old man is still alive. That sin nature is still alive and he must be crucified with Christ. Over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
I'm going to start at verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Christ died for all. But not all are dead to sin. Only those who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes it. And it is so important what we believe. Just because there is all the different denominations which were never meant to be. Christ is not divided. But just because there's all the different doctrines of the church, all the different beliefs that are preached, that does not mean a person has many different options. There is only one Savior. And He only went to the cross to do what God sent Him to do. He did not go to take the penalty for your sin. He did not go to forgive you for your sin. He went to make an end of sin. To reconcile you back to God and to bring back in the very nature that God created mankind to have in the image and likeness of God. And that He died for all. They that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now this verse 15, we always uh, encourage people, we emphasize, use a King James Bible. That is so important because the modern translations of the Bibles today have taken sanctification, they've taken salvation and put it into a process that you are being saved that you are being sanctified. No, that is not what the Word of God said and that is not what Jesus did at the cross. He said it is finished. That was His last words. Everything God sent Christ to do, He did it all before He took His last breath. That old man of sin died with Christ on the cross. It is not a process of, of God working out this sin and then helping us with this one and then this one. No, when Christ comes into the heart of the believer, all sin is gone because the old man is dead. But the King James Bible is the only Bible out there that actually presents salvation as a finished work. There's many scriptures where it says, but you are saved, but you are sanctified. But right here, and, and in many scriptures, the words should and might was not used in the Greek text. It was added by the translators to help it flow smoother, to help it flow better. But in this verse, it says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Now the word should and unto was not in the Greek text. It was added by the translators. And it makes a big difference because it is not telling a child of God that you shouldn't live unto yourself. I'll tell you, somebody that's born of God and, and born of God means born out of God, birthed from God. He is your origin. He is the source of what you are. And by virtue of a new birth, by virtue of being born again, there are things that you will know in a child of God. A child of God will refuse to be a child of the world just by virtue of a new birth. God doesn't take a child of God out of the world, He takes the world out of them. That's part of that new creature. He takes sin out of them. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Christ to whom I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. Sin has no attraction for a child of God. I hear a lot of men in the prisons, they say, but, but, but even though we're saved, Satan will come and tempt us with pornography and, and, and all these different things. And I have to tell him, he can only tempt you with what's in your heart. If that's in your heart, you need a Savior. 
We're here to tell you about the Savior that takes away your sin and that is the first thing to go. Although it all goes at the same time, nobody, nobody is born of God and still struggles with pornography. That's impossible. The old man is dead. But where it says that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, the word should and unto was not there. The way this scripture reads, if you take the words should and unto out, it reads, and that he died for all, that they which live no longer live themselves, but him which died for them and rose again. Now in in Galatians 2 and 20, most people know this scripture. It is, Paul is saying the exact same thing. He said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the same thing it's saying right here. In that he died for all, that they which live no longer live themselves, but him which died for them and rose again. He's doing the living. Wherefore, because of this, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth know we him no more. No more after the flesh. Now, I have to ask you this. Who was Christ after the flesh? Christ is the Word that was in the beginning with God, that was God. All things were made by Him, and the Word was made flesh. Who was Christ after the flesh? It was Jesus. And they did know Jesus. They lived with Him and walked with Him for three and a half years. They knew Jesus after the flesh, but Jesus has ascended. He's seated at the right hand of God. But they don't know Christ after the flesh anymore. They know Christ after the Spirit, that eternal Spirit, that if any man is born of God, he has that Spirit. And I was thinking about this today in John, in 1 John. John is telling us, try the spirits. Test the Spirit. And he says, if any man confess not that Christ has come in the flesh... He's not of God. But that, that Spirit, if the Spirit confesseth not that Christ has come in the flesh, then He's not of God. And everybody today would say, yes, man, Christ has come in the flesh. Jesus was born. He was the Christ and, and that Christ has come in the flesh. That's not what it's saying. It's saying the Spirit. Because the world is full of people who say, I'm, I'm a child of God, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I'm born of God. And they're still living in sin. They're no different from the world. We don't know them because they say, I'm a child of God. John said, test the Spirit. If the Spirit confessed that Christ has come in the flesh, if Christ has come into the flesh, their Spirit will confess it. Their Spirit will prove it. Their spirit will bear witness that it's Christ living in them. It will be Christ doing the living. It will be a holy creature. We know them, not after the flesh. And it says, therefore, because of this, verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Praise God. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And that is true. But it's even more powerful when you see and, and, and understand that the word things was not in the Greek text. It was also added by the translators. And if you take the word things out, because this is not talking about things, it's talking about mankind as the creature. It's talking about people. Therefore, if any man, this is what it's talking about, be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
The old is passed away. The old what? The old creature. And actually the Greek says the original creature is passed away. That sinful creature, that old man of sin is passed away. And behold, all are become new. All that are in Christ. Now listen to this again. Therefore, because we know no man after the flesh but after the Spirit, you know if it's Christ in that man or woman. You know by the Spirit. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is passed away. He's dead. That's what passed away means. It's the language of death. The old creature is passed away. And behold, all that are in Christ are become new. There is only one entrance into Christ. The only way any person is in Christ is through death in union with Christ. The only entrance is through His death. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, and I believe it's verse 3, he says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? And this is not talking about a water baptism. A water baptism is a religious ordinance, religious ceremony, which is symbolic of the real thing. Water baptism does not destroy the old man and, and bring forth a new creature born of God. Water baptism is a symbol or symbolic ritual of the real thing. So what is the real thing? What is the real baptism? He tells us just a few verses later, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin be destroyed, that henceforth we do not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. That baptism is a baptism by faith, knowing this. Praise God. Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. There is nothing wrong with a water baptism unless the person is trusting in that for their salvation. And then it's deadly because it will be Satan's stronghold. They believe, I'm saved because I was baptized. And if that's where they're putting their trust, they will still have that sin nature because it's not possible for a water baptism to take away their sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ, only being baptized into His death by faith, knowing that our old man is crucified with Him and the blood cleanses from all sin. Praise God. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is passed away because that's the only entrance into Christ. The old is passed away and behold all, all that are in Christ are become new. Now here's two things that will definitely be there if that person is in Christ. The old is dead and they are a new creature. Born of God. The new creature does not exist if the old is still alive. Praise God. The old and the new do not coexist in the same vessel. There is no such thing as someone who is saved from sin, born of God, and still struggling with sin. Jesus has a promise to you, if that's you. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from that struggle. Rest is when the old man is dead and it's Christ living. Praise God. Rest is when there is no sin nature for you to struggle with. And Satan cannot tempt you with sin because it's not even in the heart. Praise God. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old are passed away. Behold, all are become new and all are of 
God. All that are in Christ are of God. That's the source of what they are. That's the origin of what they are, where they came from. They're born of God. Jesus said you must be born again. This is that new birth begotten again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, born of God. And this word all means there's no exceptions. Praise God. All are of God if they are in Christ. Who has reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I wanted to talk about that that word reconciliation and reconciled. Like I said, it means to be brought back together. Something had separated us and it has to be brought back together. God is not reconciled to sinful man. Notice it said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Him. Not Him to the world. And when it speaks of the world, just like it says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. It's speaking of mankind. Praise God. God was in Christ reconciling mankind unto Himself by Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus, praise God, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I remember back before I got truly saved about eight or nine years ago, I had came to church for 13 years before that, struggling with sin. And I believed the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry was for the the pastor of the church, the pastors. And one day after I got truly saved and made free, I was reading this and I saw something. It said, God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And I thought, who is us? Who is Paul talking about? God has given to us. You back back up one scripture. And it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away and all that are in Christ are become new. And all are of God. And God has given to us. The us is any man that's in Christ. Any woman, man, child that is in Christ is a new creature. The old is dead. Sinful man is dead. He's gone. He's destroyed. Jesus said the truth will make you free. And if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's what saved is. What the modern church says is impossible. They say nobody can be free from sin. That's what salvation is. And that's the very first step of our walk with God. It's not a goal in the future. If you're looking forward to someday being free from sin, you're looking the wrong way. Look back to Calvary. It is finished. Praise God. That's what salvation is. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, it says, to wit. Now this is kind of a strange word for us in the English vocabulary. But it it means in the manner, in this manner. To wit, that God was in Christ. In the manner that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself reconciling the human race unto Himself in that same manner, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word is the gospel. He has committed unto us. But it says in the same manner that He was in Christ, now He's committed unto us. 
There is two parts of reconciliation. The work of reconciliation was the work that only Christ could do. The work of reconciliation was finished at the cross. It is a finished work. Anyone who will believe the true report and trust in Him, when Christ comes in, it is finished. Sin is gone and Christ dwells in them. That is a finished work. The second part is the ministry of reconciliation which God has committed to all of those who are in Christ. Go and tell others, Jesus finished the work of reconciliation. He won the victory and God is sending us to go tell them the victory is won. Praise God. The work of reconciliation is finished. The ministry of reconciliation will never be finished until the Lord descends with a shout. Until the day the Lord returns to this earth, the ministry of reconciliation will never be finished. This brings a scripture to my mind in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. This is how God chose to save a lost world by sending those who have received Christ to tell others the gospel, the ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Praise God. Ambassador means a representative. You represent Jesus Christ. You cannot represent the Holy One if you're still a sinner. You can be a preacher. You can pastor a church. You can pastor a super church. But you cannot be an ambassador of Christ and represent Christ if you're not given the, the word of reconciliation, if you're not given the true gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're not free from sin, you can't represent a holy God if you're a fallen creature. But all that are in Christ, the old is passed away and they are become new and they are of God. And God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation and sends us to tell every creature the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. And this word as though is the same Greek word as to wit. It means in the same manner. Praise God, in the same manner that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. In that same manner, God did beseech you by us. The word beseech means to call near, to invite. In the same manner, God was reconciling, doing the work of reconciliation at the cross through Christ Jesus. In that same manner, God is in us reconciling the world unto Himself. Praise God. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ in the same manner God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled unto God. Don't settle for anything less than being reconciled back to God. Being brought back into perfect harmony and fellowship with God. That cannot be possible if the sin nature is still there if a person is still struggling with these sinful things, be ye reconciled unto God. Believe the truth. Believe that Christ died to destroy your sin. He didn't go to the cross to forgive you or take your punishment. He's not helping you deal with each sin and overcome each thing individually and work through them. As long as that's your mindset and what you believe, God will step back 
and let you go for years. You can spend your whole life trying to do better, trying to try harder and believing the lie of the enemy that God is working on you, that Christ lives in you and God is working on you and you will die in your sin because that's not the remedy for sin. As long as we're trying and trusting in, in our ability to do better or even trusting in God to help us do better. God doesn't want to give us power over sin. He wants us to be free from sin. But as long as we're trying, God will step back and it's like God says, go ahead and see what you can do. That's what happened to me for 13 years. And when I came to the point eight or nine years ago where I just got so sick and tired of that dead, empty feeling inside. And I knew I can't do it. Lord, I hear the gospel truth being preached at Calvary Outreach. I hear what they're preaching and I know I don't have that. I knew what was working inside of me. And I was driving down the road one day and I just said, Lord, there's got to be more to you than this. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, and there's got to be more to you than this. And man, it felt like a knife pierced me in the heart. I knew exactly what he meant. When God speaks to you, he'll let you know what he means. He'll give you understanding. He didn't mean you can try harder, you can do better. That had been the problem. When he said there's got to be more to you than this, he meant you're hearing the truth of the gospel that will make you free if you will believe it and you're not believing it. You're trying to do for yourself what you can never do. Only Christ can do and he's already done it. You're hearing it, but you're not believing it. You're hearing it, but you're not surrendering and trusting in Christ and what he did. There's got to be more to you than this. And a week went by after that. Man, I felt so cast down. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't even want to talk to my wife. I just wanted to be alone. A week went by. And then the next Sunday at church, a young lady in our church that had just recently been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, She came up at the end of the service and asked the pastor if she could say something and he gave her the microphone and she said, God wants everyone to know the door is open. If you want to come, come now. Man, I just about ran to the front. I didn't didn't even know what to say when I got up there. She said, what do you need prayer for? And I had to stop and think. I said, I just want God to have His will in me. And she prayed for me. And it's like the heavens opened. The Spirit of God just fell. And I, I was free. Praise God. Praise God. But the gospel works for anyone who believes it and surrenders to the Lord. That's where I surrendered. But I've seen men in the prison that got saved during the service. Just sitting there listening and believing and jumped up and said, something happened. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone. That's how the gospel works for anyone that believes it. And and it's like out of a, a heart of desperation that wants to be free from sin. If you're one that has pleasure in unrighteousness, Satan has a, a another Jesus for you, another gospel. Because see, nobody wants to go to hell. Everyone wants to be saved from hell. This is how Satan works. That religious devil that deceiveth the whole world. He comes to a person who loves their sin. They don't want to be saved from sin, but they want to be saved from hell. So he comes to them with another Jesus that saves them from hell. He took the penalty. He forgives you and leaves them in their sin. But because they believe this is from God... They will cling to it, they'll hold to it, they'll trust in it, they'll believe it, 
and that's Satan's stronghold. Many are under that stronghold that do not have pleasure in unrighteousness. And Paul said the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and the casting down of imaginations. The weapons of our warfare is simply the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for those who are held captive to sin against their will because they have been taught another Jesus and another gospel, they need to know the truth that Christ died to take away your sin. The work is finished. All you have to do is surrender and trust in Him and believe that your old man did indeed die in union with Christ at the cross. Praise God. Something is going to radically change inside of you. He will transform you, deliver you out of the powers of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. You will be a new creature. Praise God. The old man will be dead. No more struggle with sin. A dead man doesn't struggle. Praise God. I want to go to one more place now. In John chapter 17. Just before I came over to the church this evening, I was reading there in 2 Corinthians 5 how that in the same manner that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Him in that same manner He is in us as ambassadors of Christ reconciling through the ministry of reconciliation through the word of reconciliation in that same manner and my mind went to the prayer of Christ This is as Jesus is walking from the Last Supper over to the Garden of Gethsemane with His disciples. And He's praying this prayer while He's walking. But it's the prayer of Christ. Praise God. Christ is that eternal Spirit that was made flesh. Jesus is that body that God had prepared for Christ. So that he could die, so that he could offer himself the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. uh, Jesus offered himself so that Christ could die for our sin. Praise God. But the prayer of Christ, it's like Christ is laying out the terms for His death, what He's willing to go to that cross for. And remember, Jesus said the, in, the, in the garden, He told Peter and them to watch and watch with me while I pray. He said, for the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus, in the garden of Gethsemane, He prayed and His tears were, His sweat was as great drops of blood. And He was heard in that He feared His prayer was, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine. Jesus was the man that was going to suffer the pain. Jesus was going to suffer the the whipping, the beating, the crown of thorns being beat down into his brow, the nails piercing his hands and his feet. He was the one that was going to suffer But this is the Spirit of Christ. And the way I can say that, it starts out in verse 1, chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify Thy Son that Thy Son may also glorify Thee. And Thou hast given Him power over all flesh that He should give eternal life to as many as Thou hast given Him. And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus the Christ whom Thou hast sent. I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me with Thine own self, with the glory which I had with Thee before the world was. The world speaks of the 
the beginning of time, the beginning, the entrance of sin. The world doesn't speak of this planet. This planet is earth. The world is the entrance of sin. He says, I want the glory we had before the world was. He wanted the glory that he had with the Father when they were in perfect harmony with mankind, when there was perfect fellowship with mankind, when man and woman was created in the image and likeness of God, holy and righteous. He said, that's what I want. It's like, Father, this is what I want if I go to the cross. He's laying out the the conditions and the terms of what he's willing to suffer that death of the cross for. But I'm going to go to I'm going to go to verse 15. He's praying for his disciples. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even though, even as I am not of the world. I told you by virtue of a new birth, a child of God will refuse to be a child of the world. God doesn't take them out of the world. He takes the world out of them. They are not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so, in the same way that you have sent me, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they might also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. This is John's word, which is one of them right there that Jesus was praying for. But he said, and now I'm going to pray for those who will believe on me through their word. We're reading the word that John wrote. Jesus is going to pray for us now that have believed on him through their word. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. Notice the standard. Notice what Christ is willing to go to the cross for. This is what, what He will suffer the death of the cross for, for the glory that is set before Him. This is the very standard of what it's all about. This fulfills everything that God sent Christ to do to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, that they would be one, Father, in the same way that we are one. And it says the same way that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And God does beseech the world through us. Beseech to invite, to call near, to be reconciled in that same way that God was in Christ. Praise God. This gospel is real. This gospel is the power of God. It is a fact that nobody can stop sinning by themselves on their own. Nobody can wash and change what they are on the inside. And people say nobody can be free from sin because it is impossible for us. But when it's a salvation that takes the power of God to do it, it makes it all possible because God is God. What has blinded the minds of the people is the church doctrines of today. Man's doctrines, the doctrines of devils, seducing spirits that tell people that, that you know, you're saved, but you're, we're all still sinners as long as we're in this flesh. That is a lie. That is not the gospel of Christ. Saved is rescued. Saved from sin is rescued from sin. 
for there to be a salvation, there has to be a rescued from. Don't wait till you stand before God to, to, to find out you was not rescued from hell and, and continued in sin. Don't wait till that day. For those who have been misled, that love the Lord with all of their heart, that want to be free from sin. Man, I was talking with Brother Michael today how there are things that we can pray for that we're not sure what God's will is. Concerning different things, concerning a healing for somebody. You know, God will heal. God does heal people. But we don't choose who He's going to heal. He may heal someone through us if we pray for them. But we're not sure, you know, always what God's will is concerning different things. But one thing we are sure of, His will. He is not willing that any should perish. Praise God. And what Christ went to the work, went to the cross to do, that work is finished. We can tell you with confidence, you can be reconciled to God. You can be made free today. Praise God. I can tell you with all assurity, with full confidence, Christ will not turn you away if you want what He died to give you. Praise God. He died to make you free. And if the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed. You will have the witness within. You'll have the evidence within. You will have Christ within you. The Spirit will testify that Christ has come into your flesh. Praise God. He will not turn you away. He's not willing that any should perish, but multitudes are perishing every day in their sin. Multitudes, millions of souls who call themselves believers, all believe something. Anyone who calls themselves a believer, they believe something about Jesus, but all are not free. Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, the Christ of God, the Christ of prophecy that came to make an end of sin, if you believe not that I am He, you will die in your sin. And He said, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not cast, did we, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your... He said, I will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Christ came to make reconciliation for iniquity. Praise God to take the iniquity out, to make an end of sin. Many will say unto him, Lord, Lord. And here are the most horrible words anyone could ever hear. Depart from me. This salvation is real. Don't settle for anything less than the reality of Christ in you. Knowing that your sin is gone, praise God. Take this gospel to the Lord. Become a seeker and you will go free. God bless you.